guys, welcome back to Spinning Bars. We are diving into the prophecy of Micah. And Micah as a prophet is speaking to a certain situation at a certain time to certain people. And we have one of the most helpful things we can do is just take a look at the, the kings. It's oftentimes the, the prophets will have this little word at the beginning of their book here in Micah 1.1. We're going to go back to that real quick and just grab the names of the kings under which they served. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read that again. Are you ready? Here's some kings. Remember this from verse 1? During the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So as we're trying to reconstruct what the situation that Amos is speaking into and the relevance of his words, we can look at archaeological evidence. We can look at extra biblical sources. But one of the most helpful things to do is to actually go into the historians within the scriptures and maybe some other uh, prophets that are prophesying at the same time to try to composite a view of what's going on. So we're going to take each one of these kings and just take a little look at this period of time, what was Israel like then? What was the northern kingdom struggling with? What was the southern kingdom that Micah is speaking against struggling with? Were things really healthy or were things really bad? Well, let's take a look. Who are these kings? Well, you've got Jotham. All right, you can find his account in 2 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 27. This guy isn't so great. He leaves the high places. So that's a fancy way of saying that the idolatry was left unchecked. They were supposed to be a people who worshiped the one true God, but they left the high places. So as a king, well, what did this result in? People stayed corrupt. We know that Micah's gonna have to call out this false worship, right? What about Ahaz? Okay, does Ahaz have it? Well, no, he's kind of terrible. Actually, he's one of the worst. You can find his account in 2 Kings 16, 2 Chronicles 28, and he actually has a conversation with Isaiah in Isaiah 7. He shuts down the worship of Yahweh. He, he actually shuts down. Uh, it's not just, oh, we're going to ignore the idolatry in the high places. He actually shuts down the worship of the one true God. That's not good. He enters into this international idolatry. Instead of reaching out to God for help, he makes these treaties with other nations that involve kind of tacitly approving of their deities. And he, and he worships other gods for, the, for protection. Like what? He even burns his own son. The level of depravity is remarkable. As we will see, this incenses God. This makes the Israelites worse representatives of him than the people they replaced in the land of Canaan, who were idolaters who did some of this stuff. So the covenant people of God, the, the mission of God is being run by people who are sacrificing their own children to other deities? This is heartbreaking. Don't, don't you believe that the prophetic voice is going to show up and call this stuff to account? Yeah, that's why we got Micah. That's why we got Isaiah. That's why we got Amos. That's why we got all these guys that are spitting bars into these situations to turn the people back to God. Let's look at this last king, Hezekiah. Now we're talking about it. This guy is legit. One of the best kings by the assessment of the historians. You can check him out in 2 Kings 18, 2 Chronicles 29 through 31, and he shows up in Isaiah 36 through 39. This guy renews the covenant with God. He works for reform and he restores worship. It's a high watermark in the southern kingdom. And it, it, he has some dramatic history that he is involved in. Hezekiah does a wonderful job leading the people in a renewal movement towards God. So does the prophetic voice work? Are, are people actually affected when we say, hey, we need to turn back to God. We need to call out these things and we need to renew our sense of gratitude and worship and, and understand our role, our mission as his covenant people. My, my brothers and sisters, I just want to let you know, yes, the prophetic word, uh, it, it does accomplish things. Message. God in Isaiah 55 talks about his word being almost like the water cycle. It's like he sends it forth and it accomplishes things. And God is not going to let his word fall. He's not going to let it go, come back to him empty handed. It's, it's going to produce life and renewal where it is spoken. So in these bleak times between Jotham, Ahaz, and then thankfully Hezekiah, we see that the prophetic voice actually does accomplish something. But what is the situation? What's going on? We got a little bit of, of the, the understanding of the spiritual climate of, of Southern Kingdom Israel, 
but what's going on that requires such uh, an indicting word from a prophet like Micah? Well, why don't we dive into the text here and maybe we can start to make a list of the things that he is speaking against and it will help us understand the situation uh, behind these words that are motivating Micah to use his prophetic voice. Here, Micah comes spitting bars. Hear, you peoples, all of you, listen, earth, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him, and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? So I want to pause right here and just and note these things. He's accusing uh, th th these capital cities of being houses of idolatry. What is their transgression? Samaria. Samaria is a place that pridefully celebrated the, the worship of false uh, idols. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom, and, and, and they're in idolatry. And, and he's even saying that Jerusalem has become a high place. Uh, this place of, un, of, of allowed, permitted idolatry includes the capital city of the southern kingdom that is supposed to, to be this place of worship that the nations would stream into and their prayers would be heard in the holy temple of Yahweh. And he's saying it's become a place of idolatry. Ah, this is part of our situation. What's the situation? What are we struggling with? Idolatry. We're going to run with this helpful list from Tim Laniac. Let's keep going. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes. As the wages of prostitutes, they will be used again. And guys, just for some context, remember we're going to read some stuff that happens after Micah. What is he talking about here? He is prophesying about something that will come true and did come true. Samaria was taken by the Assyrians. What Micah is saying will happen is going to happen because it did. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl for Samaria's plague is incurable. It has spread to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all in Beth Orphra, roll in the dust. Pass by naked and in shame, you who live in Shafir. Those who live in Ze'anan will not come out. Beth Azel is in mourning. It no longer protects you. Those that live in Maroth, writhe in pain, waiting for relief because disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gate of Jerusalem. You who live in Lachish, harness fast horses to the chariot. You are where the sin of daughter Zion began, for the transgressions of Israel were found in you. Therefore, you will give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. The town of Akzeb will prove deceptive to the kings of Israel. I will bring a conqueror against you who live in Merishah. The nobles of Israel will flee to Adullam. Shave your head in mourning for the children in whom you delight. Make yourself as bald as the vulture, for they will go from you into exile. Hold on. Just like Amos did this funeral dirge, this invitation into mourning, one of the responses that, that Micah is saying when you see Samaria fall, when you see them punished for their idolatry, when we see the Lord enacting his covenant curses, what is the response? We, we, we mourn. We grieve. Why? Because of our sin. We lament our sin. Check out our series on lament on this playlist. And Micah is saying, start this lament. Start it now. And might I remind you that when the people of Nineveh repented and lamented their sin before the Lord, even though Jonah didn't want them to, check out our series on Jonah for more on Nineveh's repentance on this playlist. What happened? God responded. He's saying, dude, soften your heart and grieve your sin, and God will respond. This idolatry that you've been engaged in, Things are going to fall apart if you keep going in that way. 
So grieve it and God will respond. Let's keep going. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's first light, they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. We are talking about predatory real estate practices. So where's our list? Idolatry and now injustice. These people are supposed to represent him and represent his righteous character to the world and they're treating each other poorly. Is God going to respond? Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly for it will be a time of calamity. In that day, people will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our field to traitors. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. So God is saying you're being bad with each other through greed of these these in unethical real estate practices. Well, I'm going to take your land from you. And we know as we fast forward through the salvation history that God indeed removes his people from the land in, in what we call exile. What is the situation that Mike is against? Are people receiving these words well? Well, there are some false prophets afoot that are trying to discourage people from seeing the real problems, from thinking they're a big deal. Do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright? Lately, my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe from those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. Get up, go away, for this is not your resting place, because it is defiled, it is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and a deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for this people. So here's the thing. They don't want to look at the reality. They'd rather stay anesthetized. They'd rather have anesthesia. They'd rather be numbed out, doled out, than be aware of the issues, the injustices, the idolatries that are facing the people of their day. And Micah comes to, to point it out, to, to stand firmly and say, we are not going to ignore these things. We're going to grieve them. So this is the situation that we see in the opening of the book of Micah. We're going to explore further the indictment of Micah as he diagnoses the incurable disease of injustice and the improbability, but the reality of the coming hope of true justice in a, in a ruler who would come from the lowly place of Bethlehem. So we have coming hope for a king who actually would be just, a king who would not take advantage of other people, who would actually properly show us what it looks like to follow the one true God. All the idolatries, all the injustices put aside. So as we wait for that announcement in Micah, we sit here in this situation, this diagnosis of idolatry, of injustice, and we grieve it. So there's one more thing I want to say about this whole situation. The occasion of the prophets is the disobedience of the covenant people. If, if we take a look at what happened uh, in, in God redeeming his people out of slavery to each, from Egypt, and he brought them into the wilderness, and he proposed to them, Exodus chapter 19, and, and he wanted them to be a kingdom of priests that would mediate his presence to the world. And, and, and when they said, yes, we'll do this, what happened is God gave them this whole, this whole system, this whole culture, way of treating people, these case laws, all of these things that you wade through, uh, some of the parts in the Bible that may be a little hard for us to wade through. This, this priestly uh, worship culture that would, would, would model uh, the intimacy and the holiness of God. And when the people left that, when the people decided to, to leave God for idolatry, or, or when they decided to mistreat each other instead of treating each other with the righteous character of God, they take advantage of each other. These idolatries and injustices, this infidelity to God. Let's finish that list, infidelity. Because it's a covenant contract, a proposal, a, a marriage of sorts, out of this infidelity that bred idolatry and injustice, God comes to call his people back. 
There were things called covenant curses and covenant blessings. And, and when the people broke covenant, God would enact these covenant curses patiently in an effort to stir them back to him in repentance. And this is what we see break through with the prophetic voice. Turn, turn, turn back to the one who loves you. Turn back to the one who wants to imbue his presence among you so that you would mediate his presence to the world and play a role in his global redemptive plan. What is at stake when uh, these kings and these people mistreat one another is nothing short of the salvation of the world. That's what's at stake, that God wanted to redeem the world through the family of Abraham. He wanted to bless the world to invite them back into the original blessing of Eden. And when God's people can't do it, this is what's at stake. And it causes us to more deeply appreciate what it is that Jesus has done and is doing, even as we speak. But that is the prophetic permission. Hey, people of God, you're supposed to represent him. You're supposed to be about his mission of redemption. And how you do that is loving God and loving people. And if you aren't doing those things, the prophetic voice comes to remind you who you are, and what's at stake. So yes, it's abrasive. Yes, it's gloomy at times. Yes, it, it gives us an unimaginable sense of, of how far we have fallen. And at the same time, it gives us stirring and surprising hope. So you'll see that laced through the book of Micah as we see him speak doom followed up by hope. And we get the sense that what God is doing here is showing them the possibility before them, that life and death is set before them. And if they continue down the path of misrepresenting God to the, to the world, indeed, God comes to rebuke them and he will make himself known. And indeed he does. I think I've said enough about the situation. The king's the problems and the covenant that shapes the book of Micah. So as we interact with it, keep in mind the history that we're placed in and the struggles that Micah comes to call out, as well as the reason that God is, is saying these harsh words to them. He always operates for redemptive purposes. So hear the prophetic voice as a, as a way back into the renewal of our relationship with God. I want to close with this reflection. If you were to define our era, as we are attempting to define Micah's, what are the, some big level contours of the challenges that people faced in his day and how they were misrepresenting God? How might you characterize our age? How do we misrepresent God? today.